me introduce the magnificent uh, panels and the keynote conversation we have tonight. Um, I'm going to start by introducing Ambassador Joseph Yun, who we're so delighted when he said that he'd be with us tonight. And the icing on the cake, of course, as always, is Secretary Perry, the chairman of our uh, board of sponsors, who we're so delighted. He's been so delayed on his flight that he literally walked in five minutes ago, and we put him straight on the podium. So <laughs> thank you for doing this. All right, so the golden night is we're going to have a conversation amongst us for, uh, for about 20 minutes or so, 25 minutes, and then we'll turn over and recognize our honoree, uh, Lee Francis. But you have their bios in front of you. But as many of you know, Joseph Yun was, um, was a juggernaut at the State Department. And if you don't know it, let me be the first to say he was that. As a trilingual speaker, he joined the Foreign Service in 1985 and served until May 2018. He was the brains behind the U.S.-North Korean relations and reestablished the New York Channel, which directly connects Washington to North Korean diplomats. He has been a great advocate for dialogue and diplomacy. Ambassador Yun has helped um, orchestrate many successful diplomatic dealings in his tenure, including most recently bringing home Otto Warnsby from uh, North Korea. And thank you for your service in that. He remains a point, uh, point man on North Korean policy. He's been very careful um, as he's come out of government to really um, gave, keep an objective view. But now that he's a little bit more out of public policy, <laughs> we might be able to push him a little bit and make him a little bit more subjective. That's my goal tonight. <laughs> Uh, the former Secretary of Defense, Bill Perry, needs very little introduction, but I'm going to do it anyway. Um, his foundational schooling was in mathematics um, before joining the Defense Department. He served as a sergeant in the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers in post-war Japan, and then as a research director for GTE Electronic Defense Labs in Mountain View, um, California, part of the original Silicon Valley tech boom, if you will. As Secretary of Defense under President Clinton, he helped to craft the 1984 Agreed Framework, which both North Korea and the United States signed on to, and his work with Russian con counterparts continues to this very day. He is regularly back and forth, and I usually can't contact him because he's over in Moscow. In November of 2017, Governor Jerry Brown remarked, I know of no person who understands the science and politics of modern weaponry better than William J. Perry. We are so delighted to have you as our uh, chairman of our board of sponsors. So thank you both for being here tonight. Mm -hmm. So let's turn to the Korean Peninsula. Ambassador Yun, I'm going to start with you. You have recently returned um, from, Korea, from the Republic of Korea. And so why don't you just give us a bit of a landscape of what's going well and what is not going well when you look at the recent negotiations between the US and the North Koreans? Well, thank you very much, Rachel. It's great to be here. And it's great to be with Secretary Perry, someone who understands your world and my world. You know, I think if there is anyone who's talked to North Koreans quite a bit, but really an expert in nuclear issues is, is Dr. Perry. <clears throat> you know, we are in a lot better place, I believe, than we were a year ago. A year ago, we were talking about bloody nose, when we're gonna you know, uh, try to stop them by force, maximum pressure. So we are in a better place. But what I'm worried about is certainly mixed messaging coming out of the administration. On the one hand, you have the president saying that this issue is resolved, we're in no hurry to get to denuclearization. At the same time, we have those who work for him, whether it be Bolton or Pompeo, insisting that North Korea must take big steps before the U.S. side does anything. And we saw the manifestation of that only just today or yesterday, when North Koreans refused to come to New York for what looked like going to be pivotal talks in New York between Pompeo and, uh, and North Korean uh, in charge, which is Kim Young-chul. So what I'm afraid is that we need consistent message from, North, uh, from Washington we're not getting now. I do believe that, you know, uh, President Trump did create some space for diplomats, 
but I worry that whether those just below him are really using that space. So, so kind of a mixed bag, I would say, Rachel. We are better than where we were, but our expectations and North Korean expectations are so different that I, I don't see anyone filling that gap. Secretary Perry, how do you, you've had a long experience in working on the Korean Peninsula. How do you assess where we are today, both in terms of what's working and what's not working? No, first of all, let me say, uh, Rachel, that I agree with the assessment that uh, Ambassador Yoon made. He is, after all, the many years was, was our expert in the State Department for Korea, and I very much respect his judgment. Uh, I would say where we are today, as compared to the year ago, we we're talking about fire and fury, and now today uh, we're in love with Kim Jong Un. <laughs> I think that's a better position than it was a year ago in the fire of fury, but it's not going to get anywhere, I'm afraid. Our position that we have to have the complete denuclearization before relief of sanctions will not work. And I think many people in the State Department understand that. Right. So we've got to somehow come off of that position. I don't know quite how we're going to do it. The prospect for really coming to an agreement it will have to be, I think, a step-by-step -step process. We do this, and they do that. We do this, and they do that. That has worked in the past. That can work again. But there's a dissension within the administration, I believe, as to, as to whether to do that. So the position of our present strategy, then, if I understand it, which is they denuclearize and then we release the sanctions is not sustainable. That will not work. So there's a dynamic process ahead of us in getting the administration to come to a different strategy and agree on it. And if that doesn't happen, I think we're in for a bit of big trouble. I think the, the last time we had a process that looked very fruitful was in fact what we call Perry process you know, at the end of Clinton era. And, and, and there we had both missiles and nuclear side pretty much under negotiations. And of course, it all fell apart, you know, uh, after, after the election in, what, uh, 2000. And, and, and I, I think we do have an opportunity. In Kim Jong-un, you know, we used to imagine him as a, kind of a little overweight with funny haircut kind of guy, but, <laughs> but he really has shown that he's a pretty good manipulator, you know, you know, kind of working with South Koreans, working with the United States, and working with China. And so I think he knows what he wants. Now, I'm now under no illusion, and I wanted to ask Dr. Perry this, I don't think North Koreans are going to denuclearize. You know, they're not going to denuclearize soon, quickly, but the process in which we go ahead, cap their program, stop them producing additional fissile material, stop further advances in ICBM, that, I think, is worthwhile. While we, you know, you know I, we don't admit openly that they're not going to denuclearize. That's the goal. But I do think this process that gets us, and I think we could get to capping their program. How do you think, Dr. Perry, you know? Yeah, I agree. This, this is a solvable problem yeah. if we put our minds to it and do it. But it, but it cannot be an all or nothing process. Right. Where we say, until you denuclearize, we will, we will do not. Do nothing. Yeah. Do nothing, no. But this certainly couldn't be unfamiliar to either one of you, where two sides are at the table and view the terms differently. This is the challenge of negotiators all the time, right? Which is to figure out how to take different definitions of success, as well as different beliefs in what the process should look like, and somehow find a way to find some sort of uh, common agreement. So this notion of being so far apart can't be that unfamiliar to either one of you. 
I think, you know, what is really lacking in my dealings with North Koreans is just lack of very, very common platform or confidence, if you call it. You know, there is no kind of trust, minimum degree of trust between the two sides. And our refusal to build that trust, to me, has been very hurtful. For example, you know, uh, during the 90s, we tried to open a liaison office. I mean, this is what we do. When you have no relations, initially you're going to open a liaison office as we did in Beijing and Hanoi, and then move on from there. But that didn't work. And, you know, even now, it's very difficult for small NGOs to give humanitarian assistance. Let them give humanitarian assistance, you know? Let these exchanges happen. So this lack of any connection between the United States and North Korea has led to where we are. I mean, it gets to the basic point, you know, and North Koreans, you know, when I talk to them, they say, you know, you need to drop your hostile policy. And again, I ask them, what do you mean by hostile policy? Because we've certainly agreed to things like no first use, but that's not enough for them. They want to see their regime survive and they see the United States as attacking their regime. So somehow we have to create some degree of trust that conveys to them, no, we're not interested in overthrowing your you know, regime, but rather what we want is for you to get rid of your uh, nuclear weapons. And that has been so hard to get through to them, you know? The, I learned a few things when I talked with the, people, the Korean officials in Pyongyang, especially the military. Uh, the first is the military really believes th that we are said the United States is determined to have a regime overthrow. That's our objective. And they have some reason for believing that. Some of our, some of our actions, some of our statements make that very credible. And indeed, there are some people in the administration, I think, who, who would, would agree with that goal. So that's, the military is thinking that, and they, they believe, in fact, they told me directly to my face, we shouldn't even, we, the North Koreans, shouldn't even be talking about giving up our nuclear weapons. Because that's the only way we have of deterring you. They understand that their military cannot stand up to the military of the United States. So they see the nuclear weapons as an offset to their conventional inferiority. We should be able to understand that because during the Cold War, <clears throat> we felt that our conventional military was inferior to the Red Army. And so we had nuclear weapons in Germany ready to use to stop the Red Army if they, if they marched forward. So th they see the nuclear weapons as a deterrent to us. Uh, Kim Jong-un would like to have it both ways. He'd like to have the security and he'd like to have an improved economy. He thinks he's gotten his security by building a nuclear capability, but now he's willing to stop at this point and start to back off at, if he gets the economy going. To get the economy going, and really to get the, the nu denuclearization going as well, I think we have to have basically a normalization of relations between the North and the South. And the good news here, I think the real good news here, is that that is going on independently of the United States. While we're sitting over here thinking and talking about other things, um, President Moon and Kim Jong-un are meeting and talking and actually making agreements for the normalization between the North and South relations. That's a big improvement. When I was there in 1999, right. they wouldn't even recognize South, the North wouldn't even recognize South Korea, much less than talk with them. So, that is a big positive, and the discussions between Moon and Kim Jong-un have been very positive. The issue here is whether we will get in the way and allow that to continue. And I hope, I hope we do not get in the way, I hope we let it continue, because that's a very, very positive development. I think that's a key issue, is, is that both North and South Korea getting closer to each other, and certainly what is happening there is supported by China, and, and, and Russia. And so if we, don't, if we don't watch out, as Dr. Perry said, it will be us that's going to be isolated. I mean, it reminds me of an episode in Sopranos where he said, you isolate me, I'm going to isolate you, you know? Uh, 
you know? And to put it simply, I think we should get out of the way and let the North-South normalization process proceed now that it's made so, so much right. headway. Well, maybe let's just stay on that for, um, for one more moment and then move to uh, Russia and, chi uh, and China, which you just raised. So what are the things that both of you look at that you can see, that you would say, here are ways that we can get out of the way of North and South Korean reconciliation, or what are ways that you worry about that we could make it more difficult for them? So when we look out and we watch and see what are happening, we can say, oh, they warned us about this. This is, we shouldn't be doing this, we, the United States, or, oh, this is something, you know, you're not seeing the U.S. in this position, and so therefore that's probably a good foreign policy decision. Rachel, I think the, by far the more important player between Russia and China is China. I mean, they, they, I think compared to China, Russia is a fairly marginal player. And China, you know, you know to me, the questions concerning China are twofold. One, how much are they interested in denuclearization of North Korea? And, and for that, I think they are. They do want to be the, you know, only guy around the region with nuclear, acknowledged nuclear weapons power. And I think it's very important. They're also worried about proliferation. If, South, if, if North Korea remains a nuclear weapons state, then South Korea might be, you know, become nuclear, and then God forbid, Japan and so on, Taiwan, you know? They really don't want that. They just disagree very much the way we're doing it. They have a lot of time, they're willing to wait for it. So, so, so that's one consideration. Second consideration for China to me is can they, are they okay with North-South reconciliation and eventual single state no, no, in, on the peninsula? And you know, I've talked a lot with the Chinese over the last several years. Their position is gradually emerging. I think they're okay provided that the or unified or single state Korean Peninsula does not remain you know, uh, in alliance with the United States. So those are the two things. And I think for the United States, it is critical that we remain in alliance, we remain in, in alliance with South Korea. It is much more our, our true presence in, in South Korea is a lot more than North Korea. It is also about China, it is about region, it is about projection of what we can do. If we are to remain a global power, I think we have to stay on the Korean Peninsula, you know? I agree. Secretary Perry, picking up on, on that, and because we talked about China and, and we have you here, the U.S., we've just um, learned, is uh, about to, or has stated it will pull out um, of uh, the INF agreement, the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Agreement. Um, and in part, it's because we're hearing, um, in part because the Russians are cheating, um, but also because we need to come out of the INF because of what China is doing and our need to confront them. And there's a lot of skepticism about that, but I'd love to get your sense on as we talk about um, security in this part of the world, how does the INF play into this and, and uh, how important it is, is it that what the Chinese are doing requires us to come out of the INF agreement? That's a complicated set of questions. <laughs> uh, the INF was really a landmark treaty it was made between Gorbachev and, and Reagan. And it was a hugely successful treaty where we eliminated a whole class of nuclear weapons, the intermediate range missiles. It involves very intrusive inspection. We have Americans sitting in, Rus in Russian missile factories watching the missiles go down the line there to make sure that they were complying with the treaty. So it was a, truly a marvelous treaty. It's in very deep trouble right now. It's in trouble for a couple of reasons. One is because the Russians are doing something which I, I'm convinced is a violation of the treaty. We might be able to get, have, a, have a dialogue on that and get that issue resolved. 
But the other, the other problem is that some people in the administration, not all, but some people in the administration, including a national security advisor, don't like treaties at all. And so they would like to see that treaty go by the wayside. What worries me even more than the INF treaty is the danger that the New START treaty will not be renewed. Mm -hmm. If that happens then, we have no longer any agreements between the United States and Russia, which limits or regulates it anyway on nuclear programs, and no dialogue about how to, how to deal with them. So I see this as a very dangerous trend. I'm as much concerned about the longer term implication of the INF as the INF treaty itself. It's complicated primarily because of the China. And the negotiation between the United States and Russia could, I think, resolve the differences. But the issue of China is a real, is a real issue for us because they're putting their main emphasis on the intermediate range of missiles which threaten our Navy in the Pacific. So it's something we're concerned about. And do you think that um, pulling out of the INF helps us address that? That what? That pulling out of the INF can help us address what the Chinese are doing? I think if we pull out of the INF, we'll have a major building program in intermediate range of missiles, and our rationale for them will be directed against the uh, Chinese, but it's, it's not in that symmetrical situation because the Chinese missiles are based on land and our missiles would have to be based on sea if we're dealing with China. And we already have intermediate range missiles on our, on our, sub, on our, uh, our ships at sea. So it's, it's, a, it's a very strange situation. Um, to a certain extent, I think these are rationales for people who don't want the treaties at all. And we just have to get serious about the importance of treaties in regulating our nuclear, our nuclear arms and the importance of the dialogue that goes with the treaties. And so let's come back to dialogue, because Ambassador Yun, that's your sweet spot. Um, we, have, we don't have particularly good dialogue set up, really, uh, certainly with the Chinese. But what's, what's, tell us a little bit about what the possibilities are in, uh, in Asia for the US to engage China on. Um, because it seems a little hopeless. Yeah. We have tried a lot to engage China, and uh, and I think the, obviously the last la, uh, last uh, iteration was six party talks. But even during my tenure, we did engage China. I mean, you have to understand that Chinese are basically allied. They have a mutual defense treaty with with North Korea, so it's, they they are going to be support North Korea, they want regime continuity, and what they see as stability there. So it is not easy, but we do have a common objective in terms of denuclearization, wanting denuclearized uh, China. What I do worry about in the current situation is that our relations with China are deteriorating rather rapidly as we speak. You know, before, you know, in, in, in even a few years ago, we used to characterize China as a stakeholder. Now we are characterizing them as, at best, strategic partner, if not an adversary. And I think that gets us into a worse and worse spot with China. And we have to use when, where we have common goals. Uh, I mean, obviously, I mean, you, you, know, you know, we need to be more aggressive on trade and investment issues, cybersecurity, IP protection issues. But that does not mean by cutting off, decoupling with China, things are going to work out better. You know, uh, I don't think that's the answer. But we have to push where we can work with China, even on difficult issues like cybersecurity, like IB protection. On North Korea, that could be a vehicle where we do work closely and we have used that vehicle. What I want to see is United States using the region more, not just China, but also Russia, and obviously South Korea and Japan, to have much more common platform in dealing with North Korea. So, you know, whether it's six party talks or through uh, other, or other bodies, I think we need to be a little bit more multilateral than bilateral. 
Uh, Rachel, the talk about abandoning an INF because of the Chinese is not logical. The threat from the Chinese or from their land-based intermediate range missiles, that is true. We're concerned about that, but we don't respond to that with land-based IRBMs. We respond to it with ship-based IRBMs. The INF is for controlling land-based systems. If we were to build land-based IRBMs, we wouldn't put direct them against China. The only place we do it is put them in Europe to be used against Russia. And the two problems with that, first of all, the, the, Russia, the Russians, of course, hate that idea. But just as importantly, the European countries, most of them, do not want us to put, to put, to put intermediate range missiles in their country. So it's, it's a, this is a real can of worms we're going to open up if we, if we withdraw off the INF Treaty. And I don't know whether the people who are proposing that fully understand just how complex it's going to be. So if there's anything we can do to slow down this move to throw that treaty out, we should do it. Because the, the results of abandoning it are going to be complex and well beyond the simple issues here. It's going to involve a complex problem with our European allies who will not want us to build these missiles and put them there. And we have no reason to want to put intermediate range missiles in Europe. So we have no motivation for building intermediate range land-based missiles is my, is my main point. And the fact that China has a lot of them is, is almost irrelevant at the point because we deal with those with our ship-based missiles. So a lot of times people ask, what can we do? Um, and what do you make of this proposition, actually, that we just did something by, um, uh, by flipping the house? You now have two parties back at the table um, who have the ability to um, slow down some of the investments to argue, make the current administration argue f for what they are about to invest in, can put some speed bumps in, then in fact, we actually did do something um, by putting two-party government back into place. Is that a reasonable interpretation that actually people just did something by how they went to the polls? Or is that being too rosy-eyed? Rachel, um, you know, we have Tim Risa there. I used to do a lot of battle with him, you know, because uh, he controls the purse strings, you know. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, and it's great to see Tim. I mean, quite frankly, uh, I mean, purse string is one way, and this is why it's not really the Senate Foreign Relations Committee that is the more powerful in foreign policy is the Appropriations Committee, which, uh, which uh, Tim Risa is part of. So purse strings is very important. But quite honestly, so much of foreign and security policy is within the domain of the administration, the executive branch. And I find it difficult to see any implication or significant implication in terms of foreign policy change from the election. You know? I agree completely complete with Joseph on that. I think there are going to be profound implications of a democratic house, but not in the national security field and not in the foreign policy field. Uh, there's very little appetite in the Congress in either parties for example, on stopping the arms buildup that's going on, I'm sorry to say. Um, so I don't think, to answer your question directly, I do not think that, a Republic, that, a, that the fact that the Democrats have gained a majority in the House is going to have much to do at all with important foreign policy issues or important national security issues. So we're at the end of our time, um, but let me just kind of put out a, uh, a last question to the two of you. Foreign policy is going to go where it's going to go, um, but what are things that we can put in place so that when a new admin, if a new administ, when a new administration comes in, um, <laughs> it is the bulletin of the atomic science. <laughs> when a new admission, um, that there are things in place that we can build on. So what can, what are you doing now to um, both set the stage for when there's an appetite for a different direction? That, uh, that leaders will have something to uh, fall back on? 
for me, in the narrow field of Northeast Asia uh, diplomacy, especially regarding North Korea, I, but my lesson in working this issue is we have no communications at any level, let alone people to people level with North Koreans. That, so I'm trying what, you know, in, in, in limited space I have to build those links, especially in terms of humanitarian assistance. Uh, I, I think they, you know, I, I know there are a lot of American NGOs who wants to go into North Korea to work in that space, especially in health area. I mean, there is so many people dying of uh, tuberculosis in, in North Korea now. Uh, so I think to me, to get that going and then to educate people I used to meet, that's uh, North Korean diplomats, to what to expect when dealing with the United States or Europe, with other Asians. So those are some of the projects I'm interested in so that when things go bad, you know, you don't, you don't just return to radio silence. No, Rachel, I think that one of the really important things that needs to be done for our national security is to get a meaningful dialogue going with Russia on nuclear issues. We do not have that issue today. We're backing away from the treaties, which is a vehicle from doing that. And ironically, the one positive thing in this field that President Trump is doing is trying to get a dialogue going with Putin. And the Democrats are hounding him for doing that. Uh, so when they come in power, if they do in 2020, they're coming in with a, with a legacy of being opposed to dealing with Russia and, and even demonizing people who talk with Russia. So I, I'm afraid I'm rather pessimistic about the change of administration being a positive change for, nuclear, for national security for a while anyway. We must absolutely, in my judgment, we must get back to a meaningful, constructive dialogue with Russia on nuclear dangers and nuclear weapons instead of this competition we're in and we're in right now and this new nuclear arms race is getting started. We're well launched on the nuclear arms race in both countries. And both countries are bragging about what we're doing to each other, trying to, can you, can you top this stories? So this is a very bad situation. And I, and I don't see the, any reason to believe it's gonna get better with the Democratic administration if they can in 2020. So, we have, you have, a huge education problem ahead of you with the, with the people in the Congress today, including your friends in the Congress, on these issues. We're moving, we've been moving backwards on them for the last five years or so, including many stalwarts in the Democratic Party. Secretary Perry has been at the forefront, too, of, of thinking about new vehicles for educating all of us with the uh, uh, William J. Perry project. And if you do get a chance, go to that site. He's got some incredible videos and, um, very, and wonderful online courses that I highly recommend.